Well, good morning again. turn to John chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 16 through 21. 16 through 21. John 6, 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough, because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus feeding 5,000. We know that he fed more than 5,000, but it's recorded that there were 5,000 men there. And we concluded some points or observations about the text. And this week, we look at the story of Jesus walking on water. And the two events are connected, not only chrono uh, chronologically, but also thematically. You see, both of these texts demonstrate Jesus' deity, that he is God robed in flesh. Both demonstrate Jesus' supernatural power over nature. Both are demonstrated in front of witnesses, and in particular, they serve as lessons for the apostles. It demonstrates through these examples that take place the disciples' need of intervention from Jesus. And their own efforts, apart from Christ, is nothing more than, if you will, just futile rowing against the wind. This is obvious from Philip's calculating response to Jesus of the impossibility of the situation to feed 5,000. And it's clear from the fact that the apostles were struggling against the wind to no avail. Apart from Jesus, they, we, are helpless. Finally, both events serve as an introduction to what follows in John chapter 6. As we get into the text of John 6, we begin to look at some very powerful and deep statements that Jesus makes. And these introduce those statements. And as we approach the current story of Jesus walking on water, let us be reminded of our familiarity with this verse. We often hear the phrase used, well, it's not like he walks on water. Or we may say something to the effect of, that person thinks that they walk on water. You've heard those words and those phrases. Perhaps you've even said those words. Where did they come from? Why did you say them? Or why has someone else said them? Are they said because it's simply a phrase that we nonchalantly and indifferently just use as part of our culture, as part of how we speak, how we understand something? Or does the phrase walk on water actually mean something? Does the phrase walk on water, is it based on an actual historical event that took place almost 2,000 years ago? You see, this event happened uh, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, and it's, we're familiar with the story, and it's repeated in this, uh, often, and we use it as part of how we even speak. As with many stories that are familiar, we tend to just pass them over because we've read and heard them so many times. Or even the greater danger that we just see them as part of our language rather than an actual historical event that took place. Last week in looking at the story of Jesus feeding 5,000, I stated that there are not any writings from the time of Jesus when Jesus lived that dispute his miracles. And it wasn't until the 19th century uh, that it became common for Bible scholars uh, to find some way to explain Jesus' miracles. Instead of accepting them as fact or actual historical events, many scholars just tried to find a, a rational and reasonable explanation for these miracle stories in the Gospels. The, the point of their explanations was that 
ultimately they rejected the biblical account as not being possible. It's not possible for a man to have walked on water. It's not possible for a man to just create bread out of thin air. And so as a result, these scholars began to look at things like Jesus feeding 5,000 as we're not supposed to take that literally, but rather it's symbolic. One of the liberal interpretations is that Jesus actually did not feed the crowd, but threw the little boy with the, the five loaves and two fish. You remember him. And getting this boy to share, it resulted in everybody sharing with one another. And that's the type of interpretation that focuses on turning everything into some sort of moralistic lesson. That Jesus just taught a lesson and sharing and everybody shared and Jesus actually didn't feed the 5,000 uh, by creating bread. Rather than displaying the deity of Christ, rather than the story illustrating our need of Christ, the story becomes nothing more just, than just simply a moralistic lesson on sharing. Now while these events do often deal with moral issues, that is not the point. As stated before, the purpose in John uh, of these events and John sharing these events is for the purpose of saving faith. Meaning that John witnessed these events as literal events and John's purpose in sharing it with us is that one would, would believe and receive eternal life. To believe, is a, to believe it is a lesson in sharing rather than a story that shows the glory of Christ is absolutely absurd. Such an interpretation also flies in the face of sound exegesis, an obvious reading of the text. Just reading the text, you can not walk away with seeing that that's what happened. It was a, just a lesson in sharing. When we get to the present story, one of the interpretations is that Jesus was not actually walking on rather water, but rather he was walking in the uh, shallow water near the shore, and what the disciples saw was just simply an illusion. Another interpretation is that Jesus, as he approached the boat, was merely finding stones that were sticking out of the water, or it was a sandbar, and so it just simply appeared that he walked on water. And all of these explanations try to explain the miraculous aspect of who Jesus is. Because we can't, we can't find comfortability knowing that he is God and he defies nature. Here's where the rubber hits the road. Either you believe the story or you don't. Either Jesus walked on water or he didn't. The Bible is clear. Jesus walked on water. Amen. One has to do biblical gymnastics to come to any other conclusion than that Jesus actually walked on water according to the Bible. Maybe this may seem like an obvious statement. And we can rest assured that we understand this is fact and believe it and celebrate that as a church body. We recognize scripture as authoritative and inerrant. However... We cannot take for granted for one second that many in the world would deny Jesus and do deny Jesus, and they would be quick to dismiss this as simply a myth or legend. Scripture is under constant attack. We must affirm Scripture as God's Word. Never try to explain it away. Pastor and author Steve Lawson writes this, As the Church of Jesus Christ advances into the 21st century, she finds herself standing at a dangerous crossroads. Two diametrically opposed paths lie before her. To the left are the lethal lies of liberal theology which destroy and damn. To the right are the life-giving truths of historic Christianity which save and sanctify. The modern church must choose wisely which road she will take. End quote. What we face when we come to these stories? Do we affirm it as fact? This was an event that happened of Jesus walking on water. We look to the gospel accounts, we find this attested in three of the gospels, Matthew and Mark and John, both uh, three of them tell of this remarkable event. Only Luke leaves the story out. And like the feeding of the five 5,000, it takes careful reading of the different accounts to see the big picture. For instance, Matthew tells of Peter walking on water and Jesus chiding him for his lack of faith. Uh, Mark concludes the event with an interesting verse not found in the other accounts that says, For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. 
And so if you look at the three texts, you see that they give us the big picture. And as we come to the text, I want to point out just some geographical information that paints the picture for us. I think it's interesting when we view the story from a distance for just a second. They were on the mountaintop in the previous story. Here they are in the valley. They had just seen their teacher, their, their, their Lord feed 5,000 and were with him. And now we find them in the depths of despair away from him. These are historical realities. But historical realities oftentimes paint the picture of the realities of life. You see, we see the need of our dependency upon Christ. We see that apart from Christ, there is no forward movement. We see that Christ alone can soothe our fears. And these are all part of the historical event that the apostles experienced. And these are also realities that Christians experience today. Again, this is a historical event, not a parable. But the point is that this event does give us some realities of the Christian experience that we face right now. Jesus feeds 5,000. Jesus walks on water. And then he begins to talk. I am the bread of life. And that's the, the outline of John 6. It's broken up into those three sec sections there. He feeds 5,000. He walks on water. And then he goes back to talking about the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And he gets into a discussion. This event of Jesus walking on water it is placed in between these two days because it, it's what happened. It, it, it's the chronology of time. Jesus nor his disciples, by the way, reference this event in the following event that takes place. They, they, they don't say to the crowd, you know, we saw Jesus walk on water. Jesus doesn't say, I walked on water, I have power over nature. He makes no reference to it. So when we read that Jesus feeds 5,000, and then we skip over walking on water, and he begins to talk about bread, it seems as if this episode is almost out of place. The story is here for more than chronology, though. Why is this story placed here? This seems out of place. He's talking about bread. He had fed people with bread. And then we all of a sudden see a departure from the crowd and he walks on water. And only the disciples witnessed this event of Jesus walking on water. That's it. The crowd wasn't there. They didn't see it. The previous event had thousands of people that witnessed, thousands experienced the miraculous act of creation firsthand from the creator. They experienced it. They had their stomachs filled with food, the best bread ever created by the creator, from the hand of the creator. And now here, this marvelous event, just a few. You see, Jesus withdrew from the original crowd that he had graciously and compassionately fed. He withdraws from them. And he comes near his own while they were in the midst of a storm. You see, the story of Jesus walking on water was just for the disciples. It was just for the disciples. It wasn't for the crowds. And the story of Jesus walking on water is just for us. It was not for the whimsical crowd. It was not for those that would oppose upon Jesus their own will. It was for followers of Christ. The crowds that seek Jesus out, that Jesus had a conversation with, Again, there's no reference to this event. Not from Jesus, not from his disciples. They don't talk about it. You might notice in chapter 6, verses 22 through 24, it reads this way. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. You know, they recognized something strange happened. 
They recognized something had taken place that, 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 that didn't add up. Where's Jesus? We saw his disciples leave. He wasn't with them. So they recognize something's amiss here, but they have no idea knowing that Jesus just simply walked yeah. uh, across the sea. They have no way of knowing that. But they do recognize something happened. And by the way, who is this crowd? The this is event. You'll notice back in the beginning of John, it says that a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. It's this crowd that's following Jesus, constantly surrounding Jesus, pressing in on Jesus because he is healing people and then now he feeds them. And so we, we look there looking for him. Maybe we can get another free meal from Jesus. And so they're constantly following Jesus. This is the crowd. And when Jesus does feed him, you see this in verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. They recognize this as the prophet that Moses had written about in Deuteronomy. In verse 15, it says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force mm -hmm. to make him king, mm -hmm. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. I, I don't know if you... You stumble over that. Take him by force. The crowd's response to Jesus was to force Jesus to be their a king. According to their standard. According to their ideal of what a king was. Jesus was already king. Yeah. Just not the king that fit their standard yeah. or their ideal or their agenda, or their wishes, or their desires, one that they could just manipulate. This is common to our human nature, by the way, to want a king. Well, why do we not trust politicians? They simply tell you what you want to hear, so you'll vote for them, never delivering. It's common to our human nature to want a king set in our image, 1 Samuel 8.20 says, Our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. We want a king that's a head taller than us. That has a presence about him. That can go out and fight all of our battles and do whatever we want him to do. That's the type of king they wanted from Jesus. In contrast to the fickle crowd, though, we see the disciples who lacked faith. We see the crowds and look at the disciples uh, Jesus gives them each a basket of bread. It says in verse 12, when they, when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Interesting contrast. In the story at hand, he gives them his presence. Jesus comes to them. In the current story, Jesus calms a storm. In the current story, Jesus ends their futile rowing against the wind. In, in the current story, Jesus subsides their fear. Uh, in the current story, Jesus gives them assurance of who he is, his deity. Jesus is more than a miracle worker. Jesus is more than a king. Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is to be seen as God encompassing all. All of those things. Amen. And the disciples are taught this. In this scene in two primary ways. First, Jesus does four miracles in their sight. And then Jesus has a self-identification of identifying who he is. There's four miracles though in, in this episode. Jesus walked on water. Peter walked on water. The wind ceased. And the immediacy of the boat reaching the store, uh, shore. First miracle we see is that Jesus walks on water. In verses 16 through the first part of 17, it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat. And the disciples are, are, are by themselves. Jesus had sent them, according to Matthew 14, 20, 22. He, he wants to separate them from the crowds. He wants to go off and be withdrawn and be by himself to the mountain uh, to pray. That Jesus was fully man. He's dealing with the stress of rejection. What do you mean? He was rejected. They wanted to make him king. That sounds like acceptance. No, they rejected him. They rejected him for the king that he was. 
And they only accepted him for the king that they wanted him to be. So he withdraws to be by himself. It says in this, they started across the sea to Capernaum. You see, they begin their voyage without Jesus. They leave. Jesus had told them to go. And we can assume from the text that they were supposed to leave if he hadn't shown up. It says it was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. While at sea, it became dark. And it's adding to the picture John is describing to us. John wants to see us to see these, these disciples, these apostles that are in the sea, and they decide to go out. It gets dark. Verse 18, it says, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And by the way, that it, mean, it became rough, it means more and more and more. It was getting rougher and rougher and rougher. They, they were in the midst of a storm. And notice the contrast. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And the picture is that the boat and the sea are in the midst of a violent storm. It is incredibly rough. And Jesus is just simply, effortlessly walking across the sea. All of those descriptives that we read in the Gospel accounts about how rough it is, is in contrast to just the effortless way that Jesus is walking across the sea. Why? All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus demonstrates his power over that which he created. And the word walking, it's just a simple word, walking. We're walking about effortlessly, the normal way that we would, we would walk. And that's what it's showing. It's this rough storm. And Jesus is just simply walking effortlessly through the storm. Job 38, mm -hmm. verses 8 through 11 say, Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and they said, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall you your proud waves be stayed. In Job chapter 9, verse 8, we have further description. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Jesus is simply demonstrating that as he effortlessly walks in the midst of this storm. The second miracle is that Peter walks on water. Again, this is not in John, but we do see it in Matthew. For whatever reason, John didn't put the story in his account, but they're the same event. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, it says, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter walked on water. He walked on water. Amen. Sure, he sunk. What a great picture. Jesus above the water, and it's hard to imagine that Peter just sinking. Jesus standing there above the water, just reaches down and grabs him. But it says Peter walked on the water. He walked on water. That is the second miracle we see in this. The third miracle we see is that the wind stops. In Matthew 14, verse 32, it says, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. The storm, the violence of the storm on the wave, ocean waves, as soon as Jesus is in the boat, it stops. The storm was over. And then the fourth miracle we see is the immediacy of the boat. It says in John 6, 21, they were glad to take him into the boat. Of course they were. It says, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is a miracle. There's a lot of people that debate over whether it is, but I, I cannot see it any other way than that this is a, mode, uh, a miracle. Jesus gets in the boat and phew, they're there. 
They, they, they were immediately where they were supposed to go. They were at their destination. They're, they're in the middle of the sea here, and then uh, Jesus gets in the boat, and they're at shore, at the destination, right away. Now, you can imagine the disciples trying to take all of this in. They see someone walking on water, not just someone, but Jesus. Peter gets out of the boat, walks on water, sinks. Jesus standing there grabs him up. They get back into the boat. The wind and the storm stops, and then immediately the boat is at the shore. Yeah. Not only that, did they see all of this, they had witnessed Jesus create bread out of nothing. And they're witnessing all of these things as they're, they're walking with Jesus, as they're learning from Jesus, and they see this incredible event one night. We see the result. Matthew 14, 33, it says, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. God, they worship. What else would they do? I believe that true worship is a response to the triune God. A response that God initiates in a person. And that's true worship. Spirit and truth. Is that God initiates it within the person. And it's a response to God. Oftentimes we try to make worship into some sort of emotional thing. And if you don't have that emotional thing, then you're really not worshiping. I don't really find that in scripture, though, and that's a problem with that idea. They recognized him and they worshiped him. Definitely, there was emotion in that. Definitely was. They recognized Jesus, who he was, and they responded with worship of him. And these four miracles demonstrate that Jesus is God. Amen. There is a, another evidence of this, and that is in verse 20, when Jesus identifies who he is to them. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. He identifies himself as God. If you look at why they were afraid, it says, and they were frightened in the previous verse, that, that's connected at the sight of of, of Jesus walking on water. They didn't recognize who it was. And in fact, you see, they thought it was a, a ghost. And then they see Jesus, and then they're frightened out of their minds by this. They're witnessing, by the way, the divine nature of Jesus in their own sight. Much like what would have been when they, they were, Jesus was transfigured and they, they, were, they were blinded here, the flesh is no longer holding back the divine nature of Christ as he's walking across the water. Mark 6.49 says they cried out. That's a shriek. That's a scream. It's a very intense word. They are frightened. Jesus just simply says it is I. Do not be afraid. It's very, very similar to what the Lord says to Isaac in Genesis 26, 24. I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you. Now, a lot of the same words were found in Genesis when God says this to Isaac. Fear not, for I am with you. You see, Jesus assuages their, their fears by calming reassurance of who he is. His words, it, it, it is I. It reflects the na nature of the miracles they just had witnessed. I am who I am. He says, do not be afraid. It's the word phobie, este, phobia. We have phobias. Everything's a phobia today. Phobia, este. And, and that's a command. Jesus commands them to stop being afraid. Whatever you're afraid of at this moment, Jesus was commanding them. Your troubles are done. So stop doing what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. That's what the force of this verb is. All your present troubles are finished. That's what he says. So while the disciples experienced a storm and trial... Jesus, in his own time, saw them through it. What was the condition of the disciples? First of all, they were on the Sea of Galilee. It's 700 or 705 feet below sea level on the Jordan Rift. They are, they are deep down. And the surrounding hills around them are two to 3,000 feet above sea level. So the sea is, 
is 700 feet below sea level, and then the hills are two to 3,000 feet above sea level. And as the air comes from the mountains that hits the air of the sea, the sea all of a sudden will go into a sudden and violent storm. You, you see this in, in Matthew chapter 8 where they experienced this. It says, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. This is something that was frequent and still frequent on the sea. And if you consider that today, with all of the, the modern technology we have today with boats and outboard motors, inboard motors, and, and all of the technology that we still have today with, with boating, the warning signs today on the Sea of Galilee will not allow you to go into the sea in the midst of a storm because they realize the danger of it. Now, you can imagine in the first century a small wooden boat. Yeah. Mm. These are violent, violent storms. It wasn't that they were just frightened over some small squills of water. They were frightened because this is a legitimate storm that could have ended their voyage. Look at the descriptive words in all of the gospel accounts. Just looking at the words that come straight from the gospels, it was dark. They were alone. The word rough, strong wind three or four miles from shore, mm -hmm. making headway painfully, many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves against them. This is a dreadful and dire situation. Amen. They are utterly exhausted. And as they had experienced fishermen, they were aware of the dangers at hand. Darkness and a storm separated them from Jesus, for he hadn't come to them. By the way, Jesus is well aware of their predicament. He's aware of what's taking place. This didn't catch Jesus by surprise. Mark 6, 48 says, And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. You see, Jesus came to these disciples in the midst of their despair, and he reassures them with a demonstration of his power over nature and bringing his presence to them ends their fear. They are immediately taken to shore where they are safe. Jesus did not keep them, listen, Jesus does not keep them from experiencing the storm. He doesn't keep them from experiencing the storm, but he sees them through the storm. He sees them through the storm. I think that this gives us a lot of understanding of verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Which ones? Well, probably the ones that were not on the boat. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They recognized who Jesus is. Again, this is a historical fact. This is an event that happened in time. I'm going to close with a quote from one of my favorite people, R.C. Sproul, and he says this. There's an illustration here. I don't want to be maudlin, but this is the way our lives are. The story is not a parable. It's a historical narrative. However, it certainly illustrates what happens when Jesus comes into our lives. Life is a time of pulling against the oars, against resistance, trying to get somewhere. However, we're not getting anywhere, and we're about to be engulfed. But as soon as Jesus gets in the boat, we're home free. That's what happens when Christ comes into our lives of his people. He doesn't take away all of the difficulties and make our lives beds of ease, but he gets us through the darkness. He gets us through the violence. He carries us through the storm, end quote. I, for one, believe that Jesus walked on water. And I also, for one, believe that when I try to walk on water, I sink. But it be for the hand of my gracious Savior who provides his presence. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the truth of your word, and we thank you for the presence of Jesus in our lives. Father, your word is sufficient. It is sufficient for all areas of our lives, because in it we find the very words of Jesus to comfort us. Father, may your Holy Spirit teach us truth from these words and comfort us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.